Bonjour tout le monde. To get something out of the way really quick before we get started, this video isn't really going to be talking much about the tactical gameplay of the upcoming Triangle Strategy. Multiple videos on other channels have done as much already, and will surely continue to highlight that angle. For my part, I like that the game offers a generous range of difficulty levels, and also that the pace of gameplay in the second demo is much faster than the first. But aside from that, I don't have much to add to that conversation. Instead, I'm going to stick to what I'm best at, and discuss what we know about Triangle Strategy from the perspective of storytelling, characters, and that sort of thing. That approach is a bit less strange than it may initially sound, judging by the game's, uh, descriptive title. Because based on what we've seen from trailers and from its two demos, this is a story-heavy game, even by JRPG standards. And its marketing has really been playing up the impact of player choice on the narrative. But will Triangle Strategy deliver on that promise? Of course, we'll have to wait for the final release to say for sure. But from everything I've seen so far, I'm feeling cautiously optimistic. Perhaps not for the long-term life of Triangle Strategy and fandom, although that's a subject I'll be coming back to in a bit, but I have a good feeling that we're looking at a decently interesting story with a good amount of player-derived variation. Now, I will say that I'll be pulling content from both demos in this video, because their story content doesn't overlap or even sync up, which is honestly a little unusual. It does give us a fuller, although still incomplete, picture of the game's first seven chapters, as well as provide us with two concrete examples of how Triangle Strategy's conviction system works with regard to story splits. The vote in the more recent demo allows the player to choose which of two nations they prefer to learn more about, as well as the character you'll recruit in Chapter 3, but the stakes are low enough here that I would expect the plots to converge again in Chapter 4, or 5 at the latest, ahead of the second vote in Chapter 7 that was shown off in the older demo. That vote, meanwhile, comes with lasting ramifications, as it essentially forces you to pick a side in a war and shakes up the alliances of the main cast. Worth noting, too, is that one of the character trailers released over the last two months outlines a third vote, with one of three options for resolving a particular scenario that doesn't seem like it'll completely shake up the plot in the short term, but may very well have consequences down the line. Multiple endings in a game like this are just about guaranteed, especially with the new menu feature that visually charts your story progress. Although, for the time being, we can only speculate on how many endings there will turn out to be. I'm going to go with the safe bet of there being at least three endings. However, while we'll have a definite answer to the final structure of Triangle Strategy's story in a couple of weeks, what I find more fascinating to consider is what exactly this game may do with its intricate and heavily foregrounded conviction system, a feature that might be called an even more ambitious take on the morality systems that appear in some other story-driven games. More ambitious since, you know, morality itself is one of the three convictions. For that, though, I'm going to have to step back a little and talk about Fire Emblem. Yes, I'm aware that Triangle Strategy may have more in common with other titles in the tactics genre, like Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre, but Fire Emblem is the one I'm most familiar with, and I have a very specific point to make here, so just stick with me for a bit. Two of the four modern mainline Fire Emblem games also stress player choice and branching narratives, and while marketing has occasionally made these story splits out to be questions of navigating morally gray situations and, well, conviction, in reality they aren't. Both Fire Emblem Fates and Fire Emblem Three Houses hinge their major story branches on how the player, represented by a self-insert avatar, feels about a particular character or set of characters. To reiterate a point I made in a recent video regarding a much older game in the franchise, this is fully consistent with how storytelling in Fire Emblem works. Politics and philosophy function as backdrops to character drama, and as such, the writers don't need to realistically flesh out the political goals of their protagonist or antagonist, but can instead fall back on the broad strokes of the pseudo-medieval fantasy genre to fill in the gaps between what actually matters, which in this case are the character interactions. Triangle Strategy, by contrast, appears to be following its predecessor Octopath Traveler in doing the exact opposite, 
Octopath Traveler is rightfully heralded as a visually impressive and mechanically engaging throwback to 90s JRPGs, and at the time of its release it garnered a fair bit of critical acclaim and some commercial success. But its shelf life in fandom was rather short, in large part because, when you get down to it, there's just not all that much to say about the characters or the story of Octopath Traveler other than that they're kind of oddly handled. The game relies on archetypical characterization and stock fantasy world-building tropes to the point of cliché, and it spends very little time on interactions between its eight playable characters, and relegates the work of tying all their stories together to a bunch of not especially interesting text dumps just before the final boss. On a conceptual level, Octopath Traveler has been compared to medieval collections of stories like the Decameron and the Canterbury Tales, in which groups of travelers share unrelated stories with each other. That's a clever concept for a video game, and an innovative spin on the idea of an RPG party, to be sure, but it's not the kind of story that sustains fan interest for long. And sure enough, once the minutiae of gameplay was all worked out, people just kind of ran out of things to say about Octopath Traveler. That's not so different from what may happen with Triangle Strategy, which already seems to be prioritizing the novelty of its premise and the variability of its story over its characters. I'm not saying that's inherently a bad thing, mind you, in the same way that I still very much enjoy Octopath Traveler for what it is, but more that I'm very curious to see how a tactical game plays out when it's actually driven by the political and philosophical inclinations of its players. I don't expect anything particularly profound, because we are still in the realm of pseudo-medieval fantasy, which doesn't offer much in terms of modern applicability. But the prospect of an RPG that insists that my choices matter, while not having those choices revolve around a parasocial self-insert dating sim, is an intriguing one. The setting is as cliché as the one in Octopath Traveler, and most of the characters are thinly sketched at this point but Triangle Strategy makes a sincere effort to value the player's convictions, quite literally. I quickly lost track of how many opportunities there are in the new demo to increase conviction points, especially because it seems that you can get them during battles, or even just when wandering around during exploration. Additionally, both demos include multiple dialogue prompts with three answers, but in many cases it's not immediately clear which answer corresponds to which conviction and in all instances the game never tells you which conviction points you're increasing. The three closest companions of protagonist Sarah Noah are each aligned with one of the convictions in their respective character trailers, but those associations aren't set in stone as those characters can support positions of different convictions during votes, either of their own accord or because Sarah Noah convinces them to do so. This does not appear to be a story in which favoring one of the convictions is framed as choosing one of these characters over the others, even though we already know that some of the path splits will tangibly impact their fates, as is the case with Roland in the older demo, and as is implied to occur again later in the story in Frederica's trailer. This isn't meant as a critique of those recent Fire Emblem games I mentioned, by the way. Character-driven stories certainly have their advantages, but I don't think that's what Triangle Strategy is aiming for. It's more that I suspect that what character development there is to be had will grow out of player choice. It's too soon to tell in either of the demos, but I'd like it too if this didn't apply only to the supporting cast, but to Sarah Noah himself, with his initially rather bland character developing in different directions according to his convictions. As I said, there are a lot of conviction variables at play here, so the logistics of that may be rather difficult, but I'd be impressed if it were integrated into story progression, at least to some extent. I would be equally impressed if Triangle Strategy attempts to make some kind of political statement, even if it's not a broadly applicable one, or anything more impressive than there's no such thing as a perfect system. I say that because there's what looks to be some actual substance beneath the pile of banal fantasy that is the continent of Norzelia. Thus far, Glenbrook looks to be a stock pseudo-medieval European kingdom with the potential for future development, but it's the other two nations that interest me more, which seems very much intentional, as Chapter 3 of the most recent demo outright asks the player which of the two they'd like to visit and learn more about.
The Grand Duchy of Esfrost is a meritocracy in which anyone can advance in society through their own strength and ingenuity. But it's plagued by poverty, its high-minded Archduke isn't above a little nepotism which sends some real mixed messages when it comes to his snobbish and bigoted siblings. And as we know from the earlier demo, Esfrost is set to invade and try to conquer Glenbrook under what might be false pretenses. The holy state of Hyzant, on the other hand, is a theocracy that seems mostly based on the Islamic Golden Age, as opposed to the pseudo-Catholicism typical of JRPGs. So that's cool. It's the wealthiest and most outwardly prosperous of the three nations, even offering advanced socialized medicine to all believers. But it's heavily implied that Hyzant depends on the labor of an ethnic underclass who are openly oppressed on religious grounds. While this underclass, the Rosellen people, are conspicuously absent from the Hyzant version of Chapter 3, Frederica's trailer indicates that they'll be a part of the story in a big way later on and that her allegiance to Saranoa may depend on how he handles that particular situation. Glenbrook, meanwhile, is much harder to paint with a broad brush, as it's the home base of the main cast. But between the two demos, there's enough hinting at internal dissent for events in the kingdom to swing several different ways. And note that the first demo ends in Chapter 7 with Glenbrook either effectively conquered by Esfrost, or with a majority of the kingdom's big players rallying against the Grand Duchy. That's quite the story variation, and it's in large part because of that that I honestly couldn't tell you at this point if Archduke Gustadolf is going to be the main villain of Triangle Strategy, or if the game will even have a single main villain. As with the conviction alignments of Saranoa's companions, I don't see the story coming down to a decision to favor one of the nations over the others or that the game's antagonists will be broken up along national lines, even if it's reasonable to guess at some other candidates for the antagonist role based on the official artwork alone. And although I've never liked speculating on media before it comes out, I did develop a bit of a theory on the game's political conflict that frames it in terms of the conviction system. As I see it, S-Frost represents liberty and utility at the expense of morality, while Hyzant represents morality and utility at the expense of liberty. This would, logically, position Glenbrook as representing morality and liberty at the expense of utility, which there's not yet much evidence of, although it would be fairly predictable in the sense that Glenbrook is the protagonist's homeland, and utility is the easiest of the three convictions to paint as a negative. Combined with the favored convictions of the major supporting cast, this might give us some idea of where their stories will lead. Roland, aligned with morality, finds himself the focus of the conflict during the Esfrosti invasion, while Frederica, aligned with liberty, is greatly concerned with saving her mother's people from oppression in Hyzant. That leaves the utility-aligned Benedict, and although there's not much yet to suggest what his big story hook will be, I could see it being something along the lines of pushing Saranoa to make hard sacrifices for the greater good of House Wolfort, out of a sense of duty. Those are just some guesses as to how I think the story might unravel, but even if I'm totally off base, I have to say I'm pretty eager to see what we get come March 4th. My hope is that, in a month or so when I sit down to analyze the full release of Triangle Strategy, I can make some salient comparisons between it and Fire Emblem Three Houses, as a pair of Switch tactical RPGs that take superficially similar premises in wildly different directions. Not that I expect Triangle Strategy's story to be necessarily better, but because Fire Emblem is beholden to decades of series convention and to the needs of self-insert romance, whereas Triangle Strategy is more or less its own thing, I feel like it'll have room to realize its narrative ambitions in different ways. We'll just have to wait and see. That's going to do it for me today, though. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And if you've played either or both of the Triangle Strategy demos or are still on the fence about checking it out, I'd like to know what you think about the game and its story heading into release. What do you think the plot structure will look like? And are there any characters you really connect with? The most obvious weakness of plot-driven writing is that it can be harder for there to be any notable standouts in the cast, 
So I'd be interested to hear if anyone feels differently about any of the characters we've seen so far. I'll definitely be covering Triangle Strategy more after release, so I look forward to continuing this conversation in a few weeks. Au revoir!